This morning we're uh, using our main text from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, I know you see that there in your bulletin. If you brought your Bible, you can turn to that this morning. I was thinking this week I preached my first sermon at a youth night in my home church, the Ferrito Christian Church, and um, I was 15. And uh, I think in a moment of uh, weakness, I said I would do it. And, um, and, and I just remember after that thinking, what in the world have you done? I was one of those that always sat in the back of the classroom, hiding behind somebody when the teacher was asking a question. Because I just knew she was going to call on me and I was going to give a stupid answer and everybody else in the class was going to laugh. So I was kind of one of those kids, couldn't imagine ever wanting to stand in front of a group and say anything. So anyway, I said I'd do it. My dad came to my rescue, and we sat down together and started working. And, and my dad, I'm sure, wrote most of it because I really didn't know what I was trying to do, wanting to do, or anything. But I took notes, and we wrote them on these little index cards because I thought, you know, that's all I need is to be nervous in front of a group of people, and I've got pages because they're going to rattle and crinkle. I'll probably drop them, get them out of order or whatever. So, so we went for these index cards, and then I still have the index cards. Um, I run across them every once in a while, and I kind of laugh when I see them. But I remember after the experience having several things that have never left me after that. Um, one, I was very aware of how afraid I was. I can to this day remember my knees, the feeling of my knees quivering, and my voice, I'm sure, was doing the same. And I thought, sure, I preached at least an hour. You know, that's what it felt like to me. I was told I spoke for three minutes. So how things have changed. Uh, <clears throat> but I also, in this sermon, Dad and I talked about this. There was a popular commercial at that time. Uh, going for all the gusto. Some of you have been around a while, you remember that commercial. And we worked that into the sermon, so I had to say Schlitz beer in my sermon. Somebody told me after the service, I didn't say Schlitz beer. You can guess what I might have said. Um, that didn't make me feel any better <laughs> when they told me that. <clears throat> And I immediately decided after that I would never, ever go through that experience again. God had other ideas, though. And uh, since October of 1989, when I started preaching full-time, I've delivered a sermon on most Sundays over the past 26 years. I don't know exactly how many sermons that is. I kind of did a rough math thing, and it was over 1,100 sermons uh, that I have preached. And thinking about that kind of made me think about how it feels to stand here in front of you most every week. And I always have the same feeling when I'm preparing to come up here, and that is how humbling this is. Because I stand before you as someone sharing who is very aware of, I'm aware of my weaknesses, my flaws, my sins, my character defects. And it's so easy to stand here and even before I get here and think, who am I to stand in front of a group of people and tell them anything? And it's an incredibly humbling experience. You know, I know on my own, I'm not some great source of, of wisdom and guidance. It's, you know, I don't sit down and speak and, you know, and it's like those E.F. Hutton commercials, you know, everything's quiet waiting for those, those words to flow. You know, I'm not one of those kind of people. Uh, a lot of the time, I, I'm not even sure what to say to people when, when they come to me. But I'm very grateful that I've never had to walk up here by myself. Because when I walk up here in front of you... I know that God is with me, and I have his word, and I would not do this if it were not for that assurance. I would not do it. So far in this series, we've been talking about the Bible. We've talked about its reliability. We've talked about that it can be trusted, regardless of what anyone else may tell you out there. 
it's reliable. It will stand up to the test. People just need to read it, give it a chance. And as Tom shared with us last week, this book has an amazing ability to transform us. I feel it in my own life. I'm sure some of you have felt the same. And you have watched this occur in other people's lives. And you're still praying for that word to, to continue to move in the lives of people you love as you pray for that word to change you as well. When I come up here to speak, I come with a full confidence that there is power in God's word, not in mine. But I realize I don't come up here alone. I have an unseen partner that helps bring the word of life to each of you in the way that it needs to be applied. He comes to, to convict us and to teach us and to correct us and to rebuke us and to train us. Some of you may be thinking, well, that's great, you got this unseen helper, but evidently he's missed my life because when I open the Bible, I don't understand a lot of what I read. In fact, a lot of it's dry and boring, and I just don't get anywhere with it, so I need you to send that helper my way. I say this, I'm not talking about any of you, but some people choose not to believe in the Bible. There's people that aren't going to understand him because they don't want to. You know, I was hearing about a businessman on a flight and he was looking at a woman across the aisle and she had opened her lap a Bible and she was, she was reading it. I mean, you know, she was, she was obviously, it wasn't just open and she was reading it and he noticed that she was doing that. And after a while he leaned over to her and he says, you don't believe that stuff in there, do you? And she looked over at him and she said, well... Yes, I do. It's the Bible. And he kind of chuckled. He said, really? You're going to sit there and tell me you believe what's in there is true? And she said, of course, it's the word of God. And then he said, well, well how about that guy in the Bible that the big fish swallowed? She said, you mean Jonah? Yeah, I believe that. It's in the Bible. He's like, well, well how did this guy survive in the, in the stomach of that fish? I mean, for however long it was, I mean, how did he live in there? She said, well, I don't know. I guess I'll find out when I get to heaven. I'll ask him. And then the guy said, well, what if he's not in heaven? She said, well, then you can ask him. <clears throat> some people just don't want to believe. Today I share with you some insights about why the Bible sometimes feels like a closed book. And how God wants to open it up to you so that you can start seeing what God wants you to see. The key word for today is the word illumination. 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 You know, as I've gotten older, I've not only found that I've needed help seeing, but I've learned that I need a lot more light to see clearly than I used to. Is, is, do I have an amen out there? Is there anybody that's kind of in that boat? Okay. Just need more light than you used to need to see, and it, it's just part of life. The more light I have, the better I can see. And this is also true of understanding the Bible. The more light or illumination that you have, the more you're going to get out of God's word. And so we want illumination. We want what God provides for us in that way. Again, I want to give credit to Rick Warren who developed this series and uh, Gene Apple, a preacher friend for much of the sermon material today. And we want to talk today about how God illuminates his word for us to understand it better. I'm using an outline, three parts on the back of your bulletin. Uh, the first one is that the Holy Spirit will show you the meaning of God's word and how to apply it to your life. The Holy Spirit. As Jesus prepared his disciples for their new lives after his death, he said that he would send the Holy Spirit to live in people who would commit their lives to follow him. One of the things that the Spirit does for the Christian is to illuminate the Bible. Help 
it may become more understandable. To help us see things that we wouldn't see otherwise. And this doesn't mean that you become a Christian and God's spirit comes to live in you and you're going to open the book of Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation and immediately you're going to understand everything about it. That's not what we're talking about because God's process is much different. God helps you to understand what you need right then. If you're open to a spirit. And those who don't have the Holy Spirit living in them miss a lot of biblical truth. You know, like a lot of you, I have a smartphone. It's really smarter than I am by a long shot. But I like having a smartphone. I like to be able to look up weather forecasts and know what the day is kind of going to look like. I like to be able to go there and find my sports scores for my favorite teams. You know, I like to, you know, I could watch this afternoon and evening's football games on it if I wanted to. And I can email or text with people in another state or another country. And there are thousands of applications that you can use on a smartphone. But without a battery, it's useless. If you're brave this morning, have you, how many of you have let your battery die on your smartphone? Let's just say any phone. Because, okay, that, that includes more of you. That's a terrible feeling. Now, if you really depend on this thing and you actually let it get down that far, you feel like you've been disconnected from, like, life. You know, and I realize that's an exaggeration, but it kind of feels that way. If you really lean on your phone, it's, it's like you've been disconnected. All of a sudden, kids, you know, you, they can't text their friends or all those different things that they do to communicate, and you're not in touch with a lot of things that you normally are. Without illumination of the Holy Spirit, you're going to find this book closed often to your understanding. He is like the battery that helps you and, and allows everything to work as God intended. The Spirit's work is to light up the Bible so that we can see with more clarity and understanding. I want to just look at a couple of verses here uh, in the New Testament. The first one is from Jesus when, again, he's teaching his disciples about this coming Spirit and what he's going to do. In John 16, 15, the words of Jesus, he said, All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, The Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Jesus here is talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in illumination. That he is going to shine on this word and make it more clear and understandable for those who will allow him to work. Our key text this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 beginning in verse 12. It reads like this. We have not received the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from God that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Followers of Jesus have been given the Spirit so that we can see the wisdom of God about what is real and true. So how does this illumination work? In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, the Apostle Paul wrote to them, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and the incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul speaks here of the eyes of the heart. He's praying that the eyes of their heart will be enlightened, illuminated would be another word here. You know, everything that you have learned in your life up to this point uh, um, are things that you have learned through the experience of your five senses. Things that your eyes have seen, your ears have heard, uh, you know, the taste, smell, touch, all those senses that God has given us. The things you have learned to this point, whatever it is, are things you have learned through those five senses. But when you were born again, when you were born spiritually, when you were born into God's family, became a follower of Jesus Christ, 
God gave you a second sense of senses. And you get spiritual ears to hear things that you've never heard before. You get spiritual touch to experience spiritual feelings that you've never had before. You get a new uh, set of spiritual eyes. And here he calls them the eyes of your heart. And you begin to see things that get illuminated for you that you have never seen before. Most all of us have had those experiences when you're reading through the word of God as a Christian. And you stop and you say... I have never seen that before. I've read through here hundreds of times and it just kind of jumped out at me. I've never seen it before. Or, you know that passage that I read today? That was exactly what I needed to hear. You see, when you have those experiences, the Holy Spirit has been connecting you with the word of God and opened your spiritual eyes to see something that you probably had read over and not quite seen it that way before. But it's because at that moment, that's exactly what you needed to see. That's illumination. Let's move on to the second point. Our text highlights three different ways to study the Bible. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 puts every one of us in one of three categories of people when it comes to illumination. The first category is the person who studies the Bible without the help of the Holy Spirit. He talks about this first category of people in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 where he writes there, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. And this is because some things are simply meant to be spiritually understood. You know, sometimes you've had this experience when you've been talking to a coworker, or somebody you met at the gym or somebody you met in a store and you get into this conversation and you get frustrated talking to this person because you're talking to them about spiritual things and they look at you like you're speaking a foreign language. Maybe you're talking to them about things that are important to you and they just don't understand. Maybe you're talking to them about people in the world that are suffering for their faith because they're a Christian and you would do the same thing if you were put in that situation. Or you tell them that you don't have money to buy that because you, you give to your church and that's your priority. Or you know, you're going to this Bible study and you can't attend this event because that's the same night as your Bible study. You got this workbook you're working through. You're devoting some time every night to do it. And you're talking about all these things that you're doing as a Christian and they're looking at you like, what? Why in the world are you doing that? You work hard for your money. I mean, good grief. I mean, there's so many interesting things to read. I mean, why do you spend so much time with that? This is a great event. You need to go to this. I mean, they just don't understand your commitments. Why the word is so important to you. Why the Lord is so important to you. They just don't get it. It's foolishness to them because they've never made room in their hearts for Jesus. And this is the largest group of human beings on the planet. You know, there are a lot of people that are far from God that are very smart and educated and intelligent and cultured people, but they live without the Spirit. And there are things in this book that will never make sense to them apart from the illumination provided by the Holy Spirit that they couldn't care less about. The second category of people who come to the Word are those who come with the Holy Spirit living in them, followers of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 15, Paul continues. He says, the person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 
Has that verse ever really settled on your understanding? But we have the mind of Christ. Wow. If that didn't blow every door off you have, I don't know what would. You and I, as followers of Christ, the Holy Spirit dwelling us, have the mind of Christ. Now the sad part is, we don't exercise the mind of Christ. We're too busy going to our own opinions, or we listen to somebody in the news, or we, we just, we don't read the Bible much, so our opinions are very slanted by what we hear other people say and what we think, and we just kind of ignore the mind of Christ that has been given to us, and that is to our shame, and should be a point of great regret in your life and mine. Because you and I have a wisdom that has been given to us through the mind of Christ. And this wonderful word that can guide our careers, our relationship to our families, our marriages, our dating, our sexuality, our finances, you fill in the blank because you have the wisdom of God available to you, the mind of Christ to guide you in every area of life. But you never thought about that before, have you? There's a third category of those who come to the word and, and these are followers of Jesus who live with worldly immaturity. There are people who make a public commitment to Jesus. They do everything they're supposed to say. But where do things go from there? Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 beginning in verse 1 speaking again to Christians because he says brothers and sisters. We're spoken, speaking to Christians. Brothers Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like Mere humans. <laughs> you know, Paul's not saying here that there's anything wrong with being a spiritual infant. I mean, we all start there. You know, that's expected. When, you, when you're new in the, in the body of Christ, when you make the commitment, you're reborn in him, you're, you're going to begin as an infant in the faith, and, and that's where everyone begins. But the process is, as a child continues to grow up, so do we spiritually. And Paul is so disappointed as he writes these words to this church that he had spent time with years back, teaching, 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 modeling for them. But he continues to hear that the people, so many of the people in his church, were still, still spiritual infants. He's saying when you became a Christian, you were a baby in Christ, that's okay. But years have passed from now, uh, since then, and you're still babies and that's not okay. Because you have the Spirit to illuminate the Word for you. And, and God has given you the mind of Christ. You should not be where you are. Paul was so disappointed. And he's writing this letter to, to push them out of this place that they are to the place that God wants them to be. I want to close today with three questions to measure your spiritual maturity. These are, these are questions that I think are, are serious. They're questions that are good evaluation questions. They're powerful. They tell us a lot about where we are. The first question is, have I spiritually matured through the years since I first gave my life to Christ? Have I spiritually matured through the years since I gave my life to Christ. As Paul writes, the fact that many of these Christians in Corinth were still spiritually immature years later after all of this great teaching that they were immature and selfish and worldly tells me that the passing of time is no guarantee of spiritual maturity. It's very possible to grow old in Christ and never really grow up in Christ. 
And that's what Paul is saying to these Christians in Corinth. And there are things that we can ask ourselves to say, hey, where am I at with spiritual maturity? For instance, the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter uh, 5, 6. The, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. How are you in those things? Are you at a better place than you were three years ago, last year, five years ago? Are, this, are these, is this fruit of the Spirit more evident in your life today in all facets than it was at some point you, you checked in the past? Is your time in prayer and your Bible time invigorating and real? Are you plugging in? Do you feel the Spirit moving through the Word? Do you have a better sense of the gifts that God has given to you and, and who He's made you to be? Are you committed to using those gifts for his glory? Are you just kind of sitting on them? For whatever. Have I spiritually matured through the years since I begave, first gave my life to Christ? Second question. Has my Bible knowledge changed the way I live? Has my Bible knowledge changed the way I live? Just as the passing of time won't automatically mark your life with maturity, neither will the gaining of Bible knowledge alone. But often we think it does. We think if somebody really knows the Bible, he or she is a spiritual giant. I mean, if they know the book of Bibles and the Bible in order and they, you know, somebody brings up something and they'll point to a verse in the Bible and quote it or actually read it or, or they have some insights on some things that we find very difficult to understand, we kind of look at them and like, whoa, that person's a spiritual giant. I don't want to get in a deep conversation with them. They might ask me a hard question. But I don't know about your experience, but mine is... Just because somebody knows a lot about the Bible doesn't necessarily mean they live it. You know, many followers of Jesus know what the Bible says about forgiving those who have hurt you. And set yet some of the meanest, most bitter, most unforgiving people I've ever met in my life are followers of Jesus. It should not be. Many followers of Jesus know what the word says about putting God first in your finances, honoring him with a tithe of your first fruits, and being good managers of all that we receive. We know all those things. And yet I find that those who have the most trouble with this teaching are not new Christians. It's longtime followers of Jesus who never ever really accepted that teaching and have resisted it all of their lives. The point is not what we're learning, but is what we're learning changing the way we're living. Last question. Have I grown past the sins common to worldly infants? Have I grown past the sins common to worldly, I mean, to worldly Christian infants? Paul lists three sins in verse 3 that if a Christian is struggling with these it's a sign of very little progress spiritually in your life verse 3 says you are still worldly for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you are you not worldly? are you not acting like mere humans? Paul is saying the commonly held sin of a Christian infant is jealousy. Jealousy. Those of you who brought home that first child and they were kind of king or queen of the palace for a number of years and then you brought home the second child were kind of surprised at the reception of that newborn that your oldest child gave it. Kind of like they just wished that kid would go back to where he came from. Because that is a threat to their, their attention. 
all of a sudden they're not the cute one anymore. It's this thing. And this one keeps crying and gets what it wants. And this one just has to find something else to do. And they start often looking for any attention they can get. And they start doing things they never ever did before because they've got to find a new way to get your attention. What they were doing is not working. And we know that that is jealousy. You know, a worldly infant Christian is a lot like that. You know, as long as they're getting their strokes, as long as they're getting the attention that they think they need to get, people just kind of stopping what they're doing and talking to them, and talk, making them feel good. I mean, they just need a lot of this personal attention from people. And if that ever changes, if they don't get what they think they deserve, they, they pout. They obstruct and they threaten to leave and... They just kind of let people know, hey, here I am. It's jealousy. Other people are getting more attention. Oh, they're new now. Oh, they're getting the attention. Oh, okay. And they're jealous. Paul says that's part of being a spiritual infant. Paul said the second common sin among worldly Christians is a, is a quarreling spirit. Some people just seem to thrive on tension. You know, they're always upset about something. They're always critical about something. They're always complaining about something. You know what jealousy and a quarreling spirit can do to a church? To a ministry team? To a class? It can tear it apart. Paul is writing this letter to his brothers and sisters in Christ in Corinth because their divisive spirit was tearing the church apart. But the third common sin among worldly infant Christians is that they live like unbelievers. Paul said they live like mere humans. And Paul is saying, here they were, they had the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. They could have the mind of Christ, but they chose to live like everyone else. They had the Holy Spirit, but they were living like they were no different than anyone else. Romans 6, 2, he wrote, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Paul is saying you died to sin. It doesn't have to keep happening in your life. Christ has opened the shackles of that sin and set you free. You are not you are not attached to this anymore. You have died to that sin. You made that commitment. You've moved on to better things, newer things. And you can't keep going back to that. You have the power to live differently now. But a lot of them weren't. They were just living like everybody else. Put a Christian and somebody else together and people couldn't tell any difference. Paul saying it shouldn't be that way. And it's just a sign of spiritual immaturity. My prayer is today is that God through his spirit will show you what he wants you to see in whatever has been shared today. And I want you to take advantage of what God will give you as a child of his. He wants to give you forgiveness and his spirit to illuminate your life so that you can live in what is real and true. You can understand the Bible. You can have the mind of Christ. But we need to die to some things that the Bible calls sin. Sometimes we're not progressing because we're harboring sin. We're doing those little things on the side we think nobody knows. And we're doing such a great job of hiding it. Or our attitudes are really poor. We might look good in public. But boy, underneath, we're just grinding away. And, and, and in reality, a lot of times, we're, we're still on the throne. And we just kind of want God to come along when we need help. But... We're still on the throne and, and we don't understand that all those things are obstructions to the Spirit working in our lives. Illuminating, convicting, teaching, correcting, rebuking. We need to leave spiritual emphasis behind and let the Holy Spirit show you the meaning of God's Word so that you can apply it to your life. And I'm sorry, it's a slow process. You know, all of us want the instant pill. But God doesn't work that way. Because he knows you and I can't handle it. 
And part of our teaching and our growing in this word is experiencing life hard, difficult, easy, fun, awful. At the same time we're reading and that word continues to prove itself to us that it's alive. And the Holy Spirit is applying to our lives what we need, giving us what we're going to need in the immediate future and the present because there's some life that we're to impact for him. And I'm sorry it's slow. But please, let the Holy Spirit help you. <clears throat> Ask him to help you. You know, we're in such a neat position that we can talk to the author of this book while we're reading it. And he'll help us understand it. What book can you say that about? And a lot of times we just need to say, God, I'm getting ready to read the Bible. You know, I don't understand everything I read. Please help me understand what you want me to understand today. Lord, open my heart, my spirit, my mind. Help those distractions to go away. And help me to sift from this, Father, what you want me to have. Please. I guarantee you'll do it. Let's pray. Father, I think we can all admit that we don't often look to your spirit to help us understand your word. We just use our own resources and they're so inadequate. And we're just missing out on so much. We're not seeing what you want us to see. Because we're not even often even looking. I think every times we get to open our Bibles here and in our Bible school classes and our messages and some Bible studies through the week, but dear God, on our own, we're not doing anything really. But Lord, just help us to understand what this word is. It's a living word. And you'll continue to prove that to us as we look to you with open hearts and minds and trusting in your spirit and asking to understand, to see what you want us to see, Father, you'll do it. You're faithful. You want us to understand what's important to us, what's truly important. Lord, help us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. One of the first steps in being able to understand the Bible is to become a follower of Jesus. And maybe some of you have never really given your lives to him. To come up and say, hey, my life's a mess and I need help. Because that's the same way all of us came to Christ. We just we got to the point we could admit our life was a mess. And we need somebody to clean up that mess and that's Jesus Christ. It was his perfect life and, and his blood on the cross that cleanses us of all of our sin when we turn to him. And the Bible promises that the Holy Spirit will come dwell in us. What a great gift. And we ignore it so often, nor him. Let's stop doing that. The rest of us are followers of Christ. Maybe we need a church home and we've been coming here a while. We'd love to have you as part of the family here. Come and help us grow. And I know God will work through you to help us and vice versa. That's his intent. And please help us if we're not doing a good enough job of that. Because we need you. Whatever decision publicly, I'll be here to greet you in their service. I'll also be at one of the back tables. Several of our elders and staff will be back there as well. We're happy to speak to you, pray with you. Whatever you would like to help uh, share with us today, we'd be glad to help you. But let's worship together in this song and make any decisions that we need to make for Christ as we stand together today.